In this episode, we are going to preview and predict Blanchfield versus Fira. That happens on March 30th, 2024 in Atlantic City, New Jersey. If you're new around here, I would appreciate it if you would consider subscribing to the channel. And if you are a returning visitor, welcome back to the program. Always great to see familiar faces and familiar names in the comments section. I love interacting with you guys week in and week out. We've grown a lot over the past few weeks, so I want to clarify a few things before we get into it. Number one, I am not a professional handicapper. I am just simply an MMA YouTuber, and I am giving you guys my insights on how I'm going to be betting this upcoming card. Uh, number two, the timestamps. It doesn't show up on one bar and segmented how it used to. So if you want to hear my insights on a particular fight, go to the description of this video and all the timestamps are there. Just click on the time for the corresponding fight that you want and it'll go right there. 14 bouts on this upcoming card and I want to get to all of them. And it starts off with a fight at featherweight where Nate Landwehr will be going up against Jamal Emmers. Nate Landwehr is the former M1 featherweight champion. Somewhat interesting fact about him. He's 35 years old, so a little bit on the older side for somebody that's relatively new to the promotion. According to the odds, he is the plus 165 underdog and Jamal Emmers, the minus 190 betting favorite. Now, originally, Landwehr was supposed to fight Pat Sabatini. That fight ends up falling off. So now enter one Jamal Emmers who steps up to the plate on short notice for this fight. This is the theme with Nate Land where he almost never fights who he was initially supposed to. So you're talking about a guy who's going to be unfazed at the prospect of Emmers stepping up to the plate on short notice. I don't think that's going to be a huge discomfort for him. For Landwehr, he last fought against Dan Ige. He was a plus 210 underdog. Now, Dan Ige was the 13th ranked contender at that point in time. And they were trying to essentially build up Ige again. Ige, you have to remember, was kind of going on a skid. They were trying to feed him some wins. This is a guy that they really like. He's been a staple in the promotion for a really long time. It was a one and four stretch. And he had just beat Damon Jackson to get back in the win column. So the UFC's plan was to build Dan back up again. And you have to do that against a somewhat quasi-reputable opponent. And Nate Landwehr would definitely fill the bill. So I went in, I looked at this fight because I wanted this, I wanted a fresh reminder of how competitive this fight was. In the first, it was a very competitive round. Ige sat him down. Clear first round for Ige in the second. Scored with a jab repeatedly to the body. 20 seconds, he's blasting Nate Landwehr again and sets him down. In the second round, kind of more of the same. Scoring with the jab for Ige, and he is repeatedly hitting the body of Landwehr. And then 20 seconds or so, he blasts Landwehr again and sets him down. And then in the third round, Landwehr, we saw him come out really aggressive. Elbows, knees, clinch work, high motor. And that really surprised me about him. It was a valiant effort, but let's not get it twisted. This fight went exactly according to plan, and Dan Ige ends up coming up on top. Prior to that, he fought Austin Lingo. He was a minus 270 betting favorite. And in the very first minute of the first round, Lingo looked pretty good. He cut Landwehr early, but Landwehr ended up rallying late, and I think he did enough to take the first round. In the second, you got the sense that Landwehr was pulling away. He scores a body lock takedown on Lingo. Lingo gives up his back, and you could see this rear naked choke coming from a mile away. So somewhat of a bag of mixed results here. I mean, but we do go back for a few years. This fight against Ludovic Klein, that looks pretty good in retrospect. He gets a loss against Julian Arosa, who at that time was on a bit of a tear, so not a huge uh, big deal, losing to Rosa three years ago. David Onama, he gets a decision nod there. And then, of course, the win I just talked about over Austin Lingo. So he's beating the lower-level guys, struggling against um, the elite. But, I mean, you lose to Dan Ige, you lose to Julian Rosa three years ago. Not the biggest deal. Overall, I would say he has met expectations getting into the UFC. 
He'll be fighting Jamal Emmers, the pretty boy, 20 and 7. And can we get this guy some new B-roll? Like, every time he is on a fight preview, he has, like, an afro, and then he walks out with, like, a shaved head. So, UFC, can we please get some new B-roll on this guy for the uh, pre-fight introductions? That would be nice. Jamal Emmers, 20 and 7. He last fought Dennis Bazooka not that long ago, and then he dropped a fight against Jack Jenkins. Wins over Askebob, a loss against Pat Sabatini. So, you know, tra trading wins and losses, kind of going back and forth. In the Dennis Bazooka fight, there was a weight miss, and I believe it was on Dennis Bazooka's side. I want to make sure I am attributing to that. No, it was actually on Emmer's side. Okay, so Emmer's came in heavy at, at 147 pounds. So not a good look there, but something to kind of keep in mind let's so let's keep an eye on that going into this one uh he doesn't have a history of missing weight so hopefully that was just a one-time thing the thing that stood out to me really the only thing we could talk about he puts away bazooka in under a minute it was just a it was a clean right that just absolutely melts dennis bazooka and ends the fight basically right when it begins the one thing i look at when i stack these two up is I'm going to presume, based off of history, that this is likely going to be a fight that happens mostly on the feet. Nate Landwehr, really talented guy. He can do a lot of things really well, but the thing that stands out to me about Nate Landwehr that is a pause for concern is this guy gets hit a lot, and that is the one thing that I'm expecting in this fight. I'm expecting Jamal Emmers to be able to use his range pretty effectively. Nate Landwehr being the shorter guy, he's going to have to press the action. He's going to have to get in the pocket, and that's going to come at a toll. I'm expecting Jamal Emmer's footwork to be on point for this one. I think he's going to be able to handle Nate Landwehr and his striking threat over the course of a three-round fight. I understand it's on short notice, and a lot of people are automatically going to fade Emmer's and go to Landwehr as of, by virtue of that, and I understand that, but I'm going to be going Jamal Emmer's by decision in the very first fight. Okay, guys, we move on up the card where Melissa Gatto will be going up against Victoria Dudakova. Some controversy about Dudakova in her most recent fight. There's an issue of her competing with a staph infection that she did not uh, make public. She was not on antibiotics, and she talked in, in post-fight interviews about basically her, her wound rupturing, and a lot of people were pissed off about that. She is the plus 130 underdog in this fight, and then she goes up against Melissa Gatto, the Brazilian, on a skid lately, but nonetheless, she's still the minus 155 favorite. Let's talk about Gatto's most recent fight. It was against Ariane Lipsky. It, it was one in which she fell short, and here's the thing with her. She was the minus 230 betting favorite in this fight. And the issue I have with Melissa Gatto is... It's really all about the optics with her. Now, if you have the hindsight and the benefit of going back, rewatching her fights two, three, four times in a row, and you have the UFC stats tab open, and you can go back and also look at that, you can. it's easy to have a different opinion from your initial perception on how she fights. Optically, she is a terrible fighter to watch. And... She has herself in disadvantageous positions all the time. She might be getting controlled for a prolonged amount of time, but it just seems, and maybe it's a little anecdotal, or maybe it's a bit of coincidence, I suppose is the better word. But at the end of her fights, like you'll go and you'll look at the at the striking statistics and she'll like outstrike her opponents. Or it'll seem that she's being controlled for a really long time on the ground, but then she ended up actually having more control time for her opponents and like more takedown attempts. So it's just, it's a really kind of bizarre theme I found out about um, Melissa Gatto. And in any event, like her fighting style, when she does things and when she does look good, it she doesn't always get full credit for it. And, and I don't really know why. I think that's really bizarre. And do it for yourself. Pull up UFC stats look at the stats and then go back and look at her fights for the second or third time. And you might end up being surprised, but in any event, her fight against Lipsky, that one doesn't go her way against Tracy Cortez. She was a plus plus one twenty betting underdog in the first round. Uh, she was more active despite being on her back. She was threatening submission attempts. Cortez 
was very much the passenger I felt in the very first round. In the second round, it was kind of a rinse and repeat, more of the same from Gato. I thought she had the second round in the bank. And then the third, it was a clear win uh, for C Tracy Cortez. I mean, you can't really argue the third round for Cortez. She absolutely won that. And that's the thing with Gato. As I said before, she just spent way much, she just spent way too much time on her back. And it's just not a good luck. You're in this day and age, you are not going to win an MMA fight, even if you are really active. Uh, you aren't going to win an MMA fight off your back. Just That's just not the way uh, MMA works. Now, we can debate on whether or not that should be the case, but, hey, facts are facts. So we're on a two-fight losing skid for Melissa Gatto at this point in time. Let's talk about the Russian undefeated 8-0. and She fights Jin Yu Fry in her most recent fight, and this happened at Strawway. So we are going up a weight class here. We'll see if it ends up paying off a pedestrian performance for Dudakova in her bout against Jin Yu Fry, who was basically brought into job. They gave her the easiest person they could have. And, you know, I would expect a little bit more dominance from a minus 500 betting favorite. What can we make out of her victory over Estella Nunez here? I don't really think we can put too much into it for the uh, people who aren't familiar or if you've never seen this fight. Think back to when Destin Stoltzfus fought uh, Joe Pfeiffer. It was the same situation a bizarre injury that ended up happening. So who knows uh, how that fight would have played out if they actually were able to compete and if Nunez didn't end up getting injured. And I look at this one, this is really truly for me a 50-50 fight. Um, due to Kova, plus 130 up a weight class. You know, she's shown flashes of being a talented prospect in the past. I mean, I do like her striking. I do like her strength. The move up to flyweight, I think, is a little intriguing to me. I think she's big enough to handle flyweight. Uh, five five. That's that's decent ish size. She's not going to be the biggest flyweight, of course, but no con no real concerns with me about uh, this potential move up with her not being uh with her presumably uh, being fit and healthy for this fight. And if I can get her at plus one thirty, uh, I'm okay with that actually. So I am going to take a chance. I'm going to say Victoria Dudakova gets this one done by decision, but I have uh, pretty low confidence. In this selection, it's really kind of more of a protest pick against Gato than it is an endorsement of Dudakova. I don't like Gato optically. I don't. I don't like her fighting style. I don't look. I if, if this fight ends up going to the cards, and it's likely going to, um, the, just the way that she fights, I think the judges are going to favor somebody like Dudakova. I think Gato for her to win this fight. She is going to need to have changed a lot of things in terms of how she approaches fights. And, you know, she's going to have to use her jujitsu basically to get a submission. And I don't like those things. So I'm not super high on Gato. And at minus 155, despite her being a talented fighter, I'm actually going to go the other way. I'm going to say due to Kova, get it, gets it done by decision. But this is a fight, guys, that I think it's dogger pass. All right, guys, we move on up the card to the light heavyweight division where Ebo Aslan will be going up against Anton Turkley. This is actually going to be a rematch. These two fought on the regional circuit a few years back. The results have not been there. Now, losing to Jayelton Almeida, not the worst loss to take in retrospect. He looks like every bit of a serious contender. But then a losses against Vitor Petrino and then Tyson Pedro most recently. Really not quite sure what to make of this guy. And you have to think he is in absolute do or die mode. And the UFC, they're putting him up against Ibo Aslan. Aslan is 12-1. and one. He is from Turkey. He's got an impressive record. The one thing about him that is going to stand out to a lot of people is they're going to look at how he wins fights. 12 wins, all by knockout. Not a guy that's ever been to a decision. So that is uh, very, very interesting about him. But guys, when something seems like it's too good to be true, it probably is. And that, I think, is the case with Oslan. Like, go back into his record. Look at the type of guys he is fighting. And he is fighting complete jobbers. That's great. You beat a 12-2 and two guy on Contender. Congratulations to you. But is that enough? to overshadow the fact that he's beating up on five and nine guys, 18 and 21 guys, six and seven guys. You get choked out by Anton Turkley before that. I mean, look at who he's fighting. And that is a major, major red flag. 
But guys, let's also talk about Anton Turkley. Three L's in a row. But who's he been fighting? Okay, you went on contender. But you beat a five and one guy. Okay, not a huge deal. That's fine. I'm not going to give you crap about that. You beat Ebo Aslan. And then before that, who's he fighting? So again, not the steepest competition. I don't think it's as bad as Aslan. Aslan's record's padded as all get out. This is a battle between two guys that I think come to the table with a ton of question marks. The odds have this one at a minus 110 pick em, and I think that's certainly fair. This fight, putting it bluntly, guys, was a complete shit show. And who, who knows what is going to happen in this bout? At minus 110, guys, I'm just simply telling you guys, at minus 110, this is a bout in which none of the neither of these guys really deserve to be favored. None of these, both, neither of these guys are UFC caliber, in my opinion. And I'm telling you guys to avoid this fight. Do not bet money on this fight. I just settled on Turkley getting this one done by knockout. He put away Aslan before. Aslan fades really badly, or at least he did in the past. Whether he has the cardio this time or not, I guess that will remain to be seen. But this is a fight that truly, it's a 50-50 coin flip. I have no idea. No outcome is really going to surprise me, but I'm telling all of you guys, stay away from this fight. Do not bet on this fight. You have no business betting on this fight. I'm taking Turkley by knockout, and we'll end up, we'll see what happens for that one, but I have ultra low confidence in that. You can't be confident about either of these guys going into something like this, and if anyone tells you differently, they are completely lying. So, Turkley's going to be the pick, but both of these guys are jobbers. Don't bet on this one. All right, guys, we move on to the featherweight division where Julio Arce will be going up against Herbert Burns. And yes, you heard that correctly. This is going to be a fight contested at 145 pounds. Julio Arce, a big betting favorite, minus 550 in this fight. And then Herbert Burns at plus 400. The most recent fight for Arce that happened back in 2022 it was against Montel Jackson. Clear decision. For Jackson, who outpointed Arce, the clear decision for Montel Jackson, a disappointing performance for Arce. Prior to that, he fights Daniel Santos. This was complete domination. He put on an absolute clinic and smacked Santos around for the 15-minute duration of this fight. This fight against uh, Bill Algio, he was the plus 175 betting underdog. He nearly finished Algio with the submission, and he put everything into it. But he ends up losing position, and then you see Algio just completely unload on Burns with ground and pound, and he came close to finishing him. In the second, Burns threatens a choke again. They end up grappling. Burns is in a position. He goes for a submission, doesn't get it. Algio gets out of it, and it's to the point, there gets to a point where Algio finds his feet. He disengages and waits for Burns to stand up like how he's supposed to, and Burns is so compromised, he can't even stand up, and the referee is forced to wave the fight off because of Burns' refusal to even get up. But guys, this is just a fight that I'm going to stay away from. I know that Julio Arce is going to be a popular pick here. A lot of people are going to parlay him, but at minus 550, I just think that is too much risk and not enough reward to me. Julio Arce, I think, is probably going to end up winning a decisive decision. But there's some time away from the octagon. Herbert Burns might pick up a round. Um, and, and who knows what Arce looks like. I don't know how healthy he is. I don't know what he looks like at 145 pounds. So there's some unknown factors that I look at. And I'm like, eh, minus 550, that's a little steep for me. He should get this one done. Um, so if you end up parlaying him, I understand why you would. I definitely don't think Herbert Burns is going to win this. This I don't think Herbert Burns is going to pull this one out. So I'm definitely not going the other way. I'm not going plus 400 for Burns. I still think that's way too low. But, uh, and then you have every right to be very concerned about Herbert Burns based off of that last performance, even though it was a few years ago. Um, Arce is going to be the pick. I say he gets this one done by decision, but this is going to be a fight that I'm going to stay away from. All right, guys, we move on up the card where Angel Pacheco will be going up against Kalen Lochran. Angel Pacheco is the plus 240 betting underdog, and Lochran is the minus 300 favorite. 
Angel Pacheco made it to the dance because of the epic fight that him and Danny Silva had on Contender. And this is a new weight class for Pacheco. He fought Danny Silva at featherweight, but he's also fought as high as lightweight in the past. So Pacheco is a guy that's bounced around a few different weight classes based off of his size. I do think that somewhere like featherweight, bantamweight, one of those two is probably the appropriate weight class for him, but he definitely looks like an in-betweener to me. And he's going to go ahead and take a chance in competing at bantamweight. So I applaud him for making a move like that, especially in his early 30s, making 135 pounds, probably not the easiest thing to do for a guy with his body type, but he's going to go out there and he's going to give it a go. The fight against Danny Silva, he lost a 30-27 pretty clearly, but I mean, the bout was entertaining as hell. I wanted to go back, though, because I wanted a bigger sample size. I didn't want to spend too much time on the contender. I wanted to see what he looked like. So I went back to the regional. I went back to the regional circuit where he fought Bilson Drajoni. And when I watched this fight, I did notice that he got clipped by Drajoni in the first. He definitely lost the first round, in my opinion. But then the second he pressures Drajoni, he clips him with a flying knee. And Drajoni just crumples, and Angel Pacheco takes his back, softens him up with some ground and pound, and then he eventually finds his neck and ends this fight. So there are a few things about him. Um, he does have some ability. He does have some skill off the ground. He will shoot on you. We just didn't really see a whole heck of a lot of that in that Silva fight. Let's talk a little bit about his opponent, Kalen Lochran. Now, this is a guy that I'm familiar with. I've seen him fight in Cage Warriors for a number of years. He's a young guy. He was the Cage Warriors bantamweight champion. If you were to tell me that this guy would have ended up achieving the level of success he has in MMA, I would have laughed at you because here's why I say that. Go into his career and look at who he's fighting when he starts off his career. Both of these guys, I think, are flagged from tapology like these guys if you beat restreet like that doesn't even count anymore look at this like this is one of the most horrific records i've ever seen tapology's flagged that opponent and then i think they've done that with this guy too one in 42 record so these are two guys that basically got paid to lay down that's an important caveat with Callan Lochran. Not a lot of people are going to talk about that. Like that's one of those, these are the wins that nobody talks about. He made up for that in 2022. Look at who he goes up against. Um, Luke Shanks is a very high level opponent and Dylan has on, he ends up winning the belt in this fight. So he does graduate. He is talented. He is skilled, but is he eight and one? Probably not. I think you can definitely safely scrub off two wins off of his record based off of that level of opposition, but that's not taking away anything that he's been able to accomplish as of late. The uh, fight against Dylan Hazen, that was very impressive to me. And the thing about this is he didn't uh, spam takedowns in this fight against Hazen. He showed patience. He showed he showed that he is somebody that isn't going to panic shoot like he will set things up but he's also comfortable in the feet we saw him pressure his opponent like look at look at who he's knocking out on the regional scene like you're talking about high level regional fighters that he's been able to put away with his hands um and i think that's really important the taylor lapley fight the good about this fight is he had six minutes and 26 seconds of control time the bad thing about this fight is he was outstruck in every round and he was very predictable. He didn't really set anything up with his, he didn't set up any of his takedowns um, how he should have. And I think that's a good reason why he was only two for 11 for takedowns. Not the worst result I feel for Kalen Lochran. Like he did take that fight on short notice. Um, so that is a important thing to consider. And then also take into account like, Taylor Lapley, you're talking about a guy with like two and a half times the experience as Kalen Lochran, and they were fighting in France. And, you know, so that's a tough fight for him to have to take. But guys, I fully expect Kalen Lochran to win this fight. I think there's a distinct wrestling and grappling advantage here. And I will, I also think he has the right striking tools to match Angel Pacheco off of the feet if it goes that way. 
Minus 300, that seems a little borderline to me, but I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to roll the dice, and I will go on Lochran to get this one done. We move on to the featherweight division, where Connor Matthews will be going up against Dennis Bazookja. Matthews 7-1, Bazookja 11-4. Matthews is the plus 110 betting underdog, and Dennis Bazookja minus 125. All right, guys, let's keep it on Dennis Bazookja. In his most recent fight, he ends up getting clipped by Jamal Emmers. This fight doesn't last a minute. And prior to that, he fought Sean Woodson. Now, he missed weight in this fight, but it was a short notice, and it was up against Sean Woodson. So not exactly the most surprising outcome that he would fall short in this one. I was amazed that he was only a plus 145 betting underdog in that fight against Sean Woodson. I bet heavily on Sean Woodson as a result of that. and. Bazooka just gets outstruck badly in this fight. And by my math, it was roughly like a four to one ratio. A decisive 30 27 all day long. Pretty easy fight to score. But, you know, I'm not going to uh, bust his chops. Fighting somebody like Sean Woodson in your UFC debut, that is a tall, tall order. And in fact, I would go as far as to say, like, Sean Woodson, I bet on this guy almost every chance I get. A lot of people don't respect Sean Woodson. I don't really know why. I don't know if it's because he's not the flashiest guy or he doesn't get a lot of knockouts or whatever, but I have had a ton of success on betting Sean Woodson in the past, and I bet heavily on him when I figured when I, when I knew that Dennis Bazooka was going to be going up against him on short notice. I love that look for Woodson, and it definitely ended up paying off. Connor Matthews. This is a guy that the promotion really likes. He is a Taekwondo guy. He's a black belt in Taekwondo. He loves body kicks. He likes kicks in general. That's a huge part of his game, and that's something to think about. But he ends up winning most of his fights by submission, and that's kind of the funny thing about Conor Matthews. You don't really associate somebody with his striking background to be much of a submission threat, but it's actually that's actually the case. And my theory for that is... Guys don't want to stand and strike with Connor, so they test him in the grappling. They want to, they're eager to get this fight down to the ground, and Connor pulls out his um, jujitsu. So that's kind of like a hidden thing about Connor Matthews, is actually he's a competent ground fighter. Not much of a wrestler, I wouldn't say. I don't know if I would call Connor Matthews like a huge takedown threat, but I will say this his wrestling and grappling are much improved since this fight against Francis Marshall. Uh, there are a few things that I know about Connor Matthews that I'm not going to say in here, but I can tell you that you might be surprised to learn some of the people that he's been training with to brush up on those areas of his game. Bazooka is not stupid. Try to emulate this Francis Marshall fight. I expect him to want to try to take Connor Matthews down to the ground and spend the bulk of this fight there. But I look at this, Dennis Bazooka minus 125, Based off of the results, why why is he the betting favorite? Like, name three reasons why you think Dennis Bazooka, based off of the entire body of work, would warrant being a betting favorite in this case. This is a classic dog or pass, right? Like, 100% a textbook dog or pass. Dennis Bazooka, two fight skid. Now, yes, you lose to Sean Woodson, not the biggest deal. You get flatlined against Jamal Emmers, okay. So we can be a little forgiving. I can understand it to a to an extent, but minus 125 based off of the track record, I think that's just simply way too high. I uh, actually like Connor Matthews on the feet over Dennis Bazooka, and then we'll see what ends up happening if this fight ends up on the ground. But guys, for me, Connor Matthews at plus 110, plus 115, I like that. Uh, I like that. This was This to me was going to be a 100% dog or pass sort of situation. Despite Matthews being a plus 115 underdog, most people on Tapology like him to get this one done by decision, and that is an outcome that I agree with. I think Connor Matthews is going to outpoint Bazooka over the course of this fight, but I like Connor Matthews for this one. And at plus 110, plus 115, right in that ballpark, I'm comfortable making that bet. We move on to the middleweight division where Andre Petrosky will be going up against Australia's Jacob Malkoon. This is a middleweight contest. Andre Petrosky, the plus 180 betting underdog, and the Australian is the minus 225 betting favorite. Petrosky got absolutely annihilated by Michelle Pajeda not that long ago with a cross, lands right on the chin. 
and Andrei Petrovsky completely crumples, shells up, and there you go. That's basically this. That's basically the recap for what happened in that fight. Definitely not a lot to talk about. Gerald Mearshart fight. You can make an argument that uh, GM3 did enough to win this fight. 29-28, Petrosky, I thought was the right call, even though I bet on GM3. I think it's important to maintain that objectivity, despite on how you may have gambled the card. It was a close fight, but I did think that Andre Petrosky was the right guy for that one. Jacob Malkoon, this will be his first fight since he fought Cody Brundage back uh, six months ago. He was the minus 550 betting favor in that fight, and he basically used his forearm and smashed Cody Brundage in the back of his head, and he ended up getting disqualified as a result of that. Mark Smith was warning him about where he was hitting Brundage. He had back control, and you know he's laying down the ground and pound on Brundage, and some of his, some of his strikes, even before that, were a little close. So he was warned. And, you know, I don't know what compelled him to just think he could uh, throw a forearm at the uh, occipital lobe of Cody Brundage, but he went ahead and did that. Uh, a bad move, and he rightfully ended up getting disqualified. Prior to, he fights Nick's, Nick Maximov. Remember him? Uh, he is uh, somebody that fought uh, with the Diaz brothers or trained under the Diaz brothers, I should say. And, we, and he's since washed out of the promotion. We haven't even seen him since. But in any event, he was a plus 120 betting underdog in that fight. And Maximov just completely was outmatched. He was dominated in every facet. And at the end of the first round, go back and watch that fight. And you can see Maximov just wide-eyed on the stool. Not sure if he really wants to go back out there in that second round. And it was like a wide-eyed moment for him. And he just got mauled by Malkoon for five minutes. And it's like, man, I don't know if I want to go back out there. And he, he, and to me, he just looked every bit of a guy that was too young, too soon and not ready to fight at this level. And over the course of that next 10 minutes, he landed 15 strikes on Jacob Malkoon. So I'm looking at this and minus 225 for Malkoon. That to me seems way too high. Uh, I know Jacob Malkoon is like a boring fighter who wants to basically wrestle, grapple, get fights down to the ground, and then go for the submission. Like he's going to have no interest whatsoever in standing and striking with Andre Petrosky. But here's the thing I find it hard to believe that somebody with Petrosky's skill set is going to just get completely out outclassed in the grappling department. Look, look at his record. Like he's an active grappler. And he does pretty well. Like he has a wrestling background on his uh, in his own right, and he's the better striker in my opinion. And I look at this, and it's like, okay, well, if you're going to give me Andre Petrosky at plus one eighty, I will absolutely do that. Now I don't know if he's going to be able to knock out Jacob Malkoon. Has Jacob Malkoon ever gotten knocked out before? Okay, he has one time. That's not the norm. He's never been submitted before. Guys, I'm going to go with Andre Petrosky by decision here. I'm going to go ahead. I will definitely take Petrosky at plus 180. I think there's a ton of value there, actually. All right, guys, we move on to the strawweight division where Virna Jendrobia will be going up against Lupi Godinez. Jendrobia, 19-3. and three. She's the plus 165 betting underdog, and then she goes up against Lupi Godinez, 12-3. and three. Godinez, one of the more active fighters as of late. Last year, she fought four times, four victories. It was a uh, very impressive year for her, all things considered. She gets a bizarre split decision victory over Tabitha Ricci. In no way, shape, or form did uh, Ricci do anything that would warrant getting the getting the 30-27 call that she did by Brian Miner. That was just completely bizarre to me, and a lot of people talked about that, like, what the hell? And the fight prior to that, she uh, showed her submission uh, chops. She ends up choking out Elise Reed. This is a fight that really didn't surprise me too much. I had a feeling that uh, she was going to figure out a way to uh, finish Elise Reed, and she ends up getting the job done there. Em a win over Emily Ducote, and then a split decision over Cynthia Calvillo. So all things considered for Godinez, looking every much the role of a serious contender in the strawweight division. 
She'll be going up against Brazil's Werner Gendrobia. Now, this is a contender that we really don't see a whole heck of a lot of these days. But despite her inactivity, she is still delivering. She fights once or twice a year tops, but she's going out there and she's getting the results. She fi fights Marina Rodriguez not that long ago. Now, Rodriguez, 66% takedown defense. But over the course of this fight, we saw Jindrobia really take her down to the ground and have her way with her. It was a boring fight to watch, but it was a smart game plan for Jindrobia. And you can expect that to be her game plan against somebody like Lupi Godinez. Godinez, a very competent, a very, dang a very dangerous striker off the feet. This fight to me really comes down to how do you feel about Lupi Godinez's uh, takedown defense? And for me, I've been going back and forth on this one. Lupi Godinez minus 200, Jindrobia plus 165. And, and this is a fight where it's like, man, if Jindrobia can get this fight down to the ground, I like her chances there. But guys, I'm going to go with Lupi Godinez in this one. I'm not going to get cute. I'm not going to take Jindrobia. It is a little bit tempting, but I do find it very, very difficult to believe that she is going to outclass Godinez in the grappling and the wrestling. Lupi Godinez to me is just way too good. Um, she's not going to get fooled. She is not going to let Jindrobia do dominate her in the grappling and wrestling like how she did Marina Rodriguez. I don't see that one happening. It's minus 200. That is a little bit borderline to me. I don't know if I would endorse a bet that's really beyond that at this point, but at the time of this recording, uh, I can get her at around minus 200. So I will go ahead. I'll pull the trigger on that one. I think there's going to be a huge striking differential between the two. I think that even though she has the uh, even though she's the shorter fighter, even though she has uh, a bit of a reach issue, um, I, I do think that there's a significant striking differential there that warrants why she would be the minus 200 betting favorite. Look for Jindrobia to try to replicate what she did against Rodriguez, but I don't think it's going to work this time. I'm going to take Hodri. I'm going to take Lupi Godinez in this fight, and I say she gets it done by decision i do think it will go the distance gingerobia might end up picking up around but look for godinez to make the adjustments you know, she's surging and she's the hot hand right now i'm gonna ride the hot hand to uh get me a win in this fight so i will go ahead i will pull the trigger on godinez to get this one done at minus 200 moving on up the card we have a fight at featherweight where bill algio will be going up against canada's kyle nelson he fought Alexander Hernandez in his most recent fight. He was the plus 100 betting underdog. Uh, I think of Alexander Hernandez. I think about somebody uh, that can wrestle, that can grapple, and we just really didn't see that over the course of that fight. Prior to that, Algeo gets a submission victory over TJ Brown. He was a minus 200 betting favorite in this one. It was a competitive first round that I personally scored for Brown. He outstruck Algeo. He busted him open. And then in the beginning of the second, it looks like Brown is continuing to ride that wave. He looks good at the early parts of that round, but Algio counters him beautifully, sits down TJ Brown. They start grappling, and then Bill Algio en ends up uh, getting a rear naked choke victory off of Brown. Now he'll be going up against Kyle Nelson. Now Kyle Nelson was a bit of a meme fighter at one point. His career definitely did not start off the way I think he had hoped. Look at the results here. He gets a win over Polo Reyes, and he drops fights against um, Diego Fajeda, Matt Sales, who's no longer in the promotion, Billy Quarantillo, Billy Quarantillo, and then Jai Herbert. He draws Duhu Choi. So you have to know, going into that UFC 290, 289 fight, the idea was to get Blake Builder win. And who better to... Uh, pull off of the uh, featherweight scrap heap than Kyle Nelson. The uh, builder fight, though, did not go according to plan. Nelson plus 230 dog, and he ends up absolutely outclassing builder over the course of the three rounds. I had to score 29-28 for Nelson, but you can make an argument that he 30-27 Blake Builder. The Mexican card in Las Vegas, and kind of the same deal. They brought him in job for fernando padilla to make the mexican fans happy and that didn't happen plus 205 betting underdog close fight unanimous decision the judges had this one 29 28 29 28 and then sal diamato turns in a 30 27 card 
there were a few people that thought Padilla won this fight. Like, I bet on Kyle Nelson for that one because I looked at it and I was just like, eh, Nelson at uh, plus 205 against a relatively unknown, unproven prospect in Fernando P Padilla. Eh, I'll throw a few bucks on this one. And I ended up getting a little lucky on that one, I think. But we have to make a decision. Bill Algio versus Kyle Nelson. Bill Algio at minus 190, guys. I think that's the right play here. Um, I like Bill Algio in this fight. I think that his uh, striking is miles better than Kyle Nelson. I like the fact that Bill is from Philadelphia, and this is basically going to be a home game for him. For me, guys, it comes down to how do I think Bill Algio is going to win? There's an obvious striking advantage there. I think Bill Algio is just the more superior fighter. I think he can grapple too fairly well if you make him. Uh, I don't know if he puts away uh, Kyle Nelson though over the course of this fight. Um, but I do think Algio at minus uh, 190 is still a little bit of a bargain. I expected the odds to be way worse than that. I was expecting Bill Algio to be like minus 300 or something crazy like that, but he's not. We can still get him at minus 190, and I think, guys, that's the right play here. All right, guys, we move on to the middleweight division where Nurislatan Ruziboyev will be going up against Cedricus Dumas in a middleweight contest. Ruzi Boyev, minus 275 betting favorite, and then the comeback on Cedricus Dumas, plus 220. In his most recent fight, Ruzi Boyev fought Bruno Fajeda. He was a plus 180 underdog, and he completely annihilated Bruno Fajeda, cartoonishly knocking him out, despite having a nasty-ass staph infection on his leg that ruptured when he got leg kicked in this fight. 30 years old, 6'5", so he's freaking huge. And look at all the, look at this record, 33, 8, and 2. I mean, that is a crap load of fights for somebody who's only 30 years old. And he trains out of Marquez, MMA in Philadelphia, okay. 20 wins by submission. 11 by knockout, a lot to like. When it comes to gambling, it, it, it pays dividends to be a skeptic. Look at who he's fighting. A 12 and 12 guy. You beat a 13 and four guy. Okay. A 15 and two guy. Okay. But you Kimura, a 20 and 10 guy, you beat up on a four and four guy, a 10 and eight guy, a 20 and 25 guy. Do you see what I'm saying, guys? Like he is styled on some jobbers is what I'm getting at his level of competition. I question the accuracy of this record. This is the type of guy like you have guys that fight overseas in Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, wherever, and then come fight night, you go back to tapology, and then like right before these guys are getting ready to fight, additional information comes down, and then like three or four or five fights end up dropping off for whatever reason because the record keeping isn't accurate. And that's a concern I have with this guy. Like, is he as advertised? Is he as good as what everyone thinks he is? And I still don't, I have questions about this guy. I really do. Um, and at minus two, 275, there's just no way in hell I'm betting on this guy. So we'll see. We'll see if he is as advertised. But everyone's going to fall in love with this guy. And I'm not trying to take away anything against what he did against Bruno Fajeda. Um, it was an impressive knockout. And Fajeda was an undefeated contender. That's all fine and well. Cedricus Dumas, a bit of a knucklehead. He is, he is talented, though. Um, and there are a lot of people that look at this guy and they don't like him. They get those Greg Hardy vibes and Hey, I completely understand. We're not going to talk uh, a little bit about that, but it's worth mentioning. He did get in trouble with the law again. Um, most recently because of a alleged domestic dispute. Now how that affected his training, how that's, if that's going to play a role, if any into this fight that remains to be seen nine and one record plus two twenty underdog. He fights. Abu Azaitar, not that long ago. And then prior to that, he fought Cody Brundage. Because here's the thing about Cedricus Dumas. You don't have to like this guy, but you have to respect him. Like, he says some pretty cringe things. Like, look at uh, his interactions that him and Josh Fremd had not that long ago. Like, Josh Fremd choked him out, won this fight pretty decisively. And Cedricus Dumas is, like, completely roasting him and talking shit the entire time after getting choked out by Josh Fremd. And Josh Fremd was like nice about it. Like, yeah, I choked you out. But if you want to come train with me, that's fine. Like Josh Fremd had every reason to like talk mad hit, mad shit on Cedricus Dumas and he didn't. And uh, so Cedricus is kind of cringe. 
Um, but when when but when it comes to like his actual fighting prowess and his abilities as a mixed martial artist, like don't let your personal feelings for him get in the way of what you see in the cage. And I'm gonna try to connect the dots for you guys. Josh Fremd, wrestler, Factory X MMA, gets a win off of Dumas. He follows that up. Enter Cody Brundage. Cody Brundage, wrestler. Where is he trained out of? Factory X. So Factory X, they have the game plan. They know how to beat this guy. They've seen him before. And Dumas was going to go up against two guys that are somewhat similar to one another from the same gym. And I looked at that and I was and I thought to myself, like, okay, well, this is going to be an interesting fight because Factory X just beat Dumas. How's he going to show up? And this is a fight that he was a plus 145 betting underdog going into. And I understand why. When you take into account that dynamic, you can understand why he would be a, do a, a dog. Brundage shoots on Dumas. And there's a scramble that ensues, and Brundage goes for a guillotine right away. Dumas slips the guillotine ends up controlling Brundage for the rest of the first round. Clearly gets round number one in the bag. In the second round, Cody Brundage shows up, shoots a naked takedown on Dumas, gets stuffed easily. And for the rest of the second, Dumas just completely outgrapples him. And it's more of the same in the third. Cody Brundage shoots on Dumas. Dumas easily stuffs it. Um, when they do end up grappling, Dumas has the upper hand over the course of the entire fight. He's defending submissions. He's reversing positions. He's scrambling. He's ending up on top. Like, Cedricus Dumas is a competent grappler. And if you don't believe me, if you don't think he, this guy can grapple, go and watch this fight for yourself. Go and watch him fight Cody Brundage. And... You might be surprised is all I'm trying to say because like I do feel like guys like Cedricus Dumas like because of the legal stuff because he may not be the most likable guy like it causes us to stereotype him and maybe causes us to di diminish him and uh, underestimate him and I'm not going to do that and Cedricus Dumas he ha he is the for sure correct underdog plus 220 he has like that's the right line for this one like this Ruz Boyev guy, he's been impressive. That's great that you knocked out a 10-0 and guy and you styled on him, but I have questions about your resume, and I don't know if your record is what it would portray you to be. And, uh, guys, I'm going to take a flyer on SD Dumas in this fight. I am going to bet on Cedricus Dumas at plus 220. Uh, I'm, I'm okay taking – I'm gambling. I know I am. But I'm okay taking a gamble on Cedricus Dumas. Nobody thinks he's going to win. Everyone thinks he is going to get absolutely steamrolled by Ruz Boyev based off of this betting line. But we'll see. We will see because Cedricus Dumas, he's never been finished. Nobody's ever finished him uh, by knockout. Josh Friend was the only one that choked him out. And we'll see if that ends up being the case. It would seem to me that... That's going to be the game plan to try to grapple with Cedricus Dumas. But I think people are underestimating this guy's grappling abilities. I think Cedricus Dumas can grapple. And I, his, as far as his legal situation, this guy's been in and out of jail like most of his adult life. I don't think, it, I don't think it, he gives two shits about it, quite honestly. And I'm not trying to make a statement here. I'm not trying to, you know... I, I'm not even going to get into that, but I'm just going to say like this guy has had run-ins in his uh, throughout his adult life, and and it really hasn't affected him up to this point. We'll see, uh, you know, how that uh, plays out when he's going up against the uh, top middleweight contenders in the UFC. But he's going up against an unproven guy in Ruz Boyev that I don't think he is as, uh, and I think it remains to be seen if he is what his record portrays him as. We'll see. But Cedricus Dumas at plus 220, guys, I'm going to take the chance here. Uh, I'm all over this one. I looked at this, and I thought to myself, like, oh, yeah, I I think Cedricus Dumas is the more proven commodity. I hope he's a big underdog in this one. And uh, 
sure enough, he he definitely is. I think there's a ton of value here, and uh, that's what I'll be doing in this fight. We move on to the welterweight division where Chidi Nokuwani will be going up against Riz McKee. Yes, you heard that correctly. The welterweight division. You can kind of understand why he would uh, make a move of this of this nature. Uh, three on a three fight skid, he gets knocked out by Mihal Olajechuk in his most recent fight. Prior to that, a loss against Albert Durayev, and then also a loss against Gregory Rodriguez. Now finishes against getting finished by Rodriguez and Ola Jacek, not the biggest surprise to me. Those guys come to bang. That is really what they are all about. You uh, drop fights against those two guys, not the worst loss to take. Durayev, I think Durayev is a little bit underrated. So um, taking that skid into context, um, I don't think it's as bad as what it looks like. Um but nonetheless, he's going down to the welterweight division to see if he can have better luck there. And he'll be going up against Reese McKee, the former Cage Warriors welterweight champion, who is the plus 185 betting underdog in this fight. Reese McKee, I look at him and I see flashes of a talented fighter. The, con- the thing that concerns me about him is his physicality or lack thereof. It just seems that he gets bullied and outmuscled and outpowered in every single one of his fights. And it's great that you're, you know, and it's great that you um, go back to regionals and you do well. This knockout win against Justin Berlinson. I mean, Justin Berlinson's a a decent fighter. Um, so that's a good win for him. Uh, Jimmy Wallhead, he's uh, definitely a guy that's past his prime. And then Angelusa just completely uncorked on uh reese mckee guys this is one of those things where i will be staying away from this fight uh i don't know if i can do chidi nokuwani at minus 225 this is a new weight class keep in mind we don't really know what he's going to look like i do think chidi can be a little chinny um but reese mckee i just don't know if he is a ufc level fighter um chidi wins this one by decision i think he's just the stronger fighter i think he's going to bully Reese McKee, I think Reese McKee can get bullied. I don't know if Reese McKee is a UFC caliber fighter. Um, I I like Reese McKee, but this guy has just burned me way too many times. I bet him against Alex Morono. I bet him against Angelusa as an underdog. It hasn't worked out for me. Uh, Chidi's going into this fight, the minus 225 betting favorite. I think that's a high risk because I just don't know what he looks like. And again, I have concerns about his chin. I am staying away from this fight, but for betting purposes, I'll say Chidi gets this one done by decision. All right, guys, we just talked about a fight you shouldn't bet on in the welterweight division. Well, I'm going to follow that up with another fight you should not bet on in the middleweight division where Bruno Silva will be going up against Chris Weidman. Bruno Silva, minus 275, and then Chris Weidman, plus 210. Don't bet on this fight, guys. Like, I'm telling you, like, Bruno Silva is a scrub. Don't bet on him at minus 275. You're crazy. Chris Weidman, plus 210 you really want to bet on a guy with like two broken legs um, that is on the way out. Like Chris Weidman is not the same Chris Weidman. Like guys, I'm going to, I'm going to do you a solid, right? I will bet on this fight. So you guys don't have to, and I'm going to put up my betting slip right here. $1. That is what I'm betting on this fight. $1 because gambling is like, is like bubble wrap to some of you. Some of you guys can't help yourselves and I get it. I get it. And I'm kid guys. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But look like I'm betting on this fight. So you don't have to look at that slip right there. And that tells you how you should treat this fight. Put $1 on it. If you really want to bet on this fight, put a, put a dollar on it because I have no idea what's going to happen. Bruno Silva is a scrub. Like this guy is not a good fighter. Don't bet on bad fighters. Don't bet on bad fighters. Why would you? And at minus 275, I think you're absolutely crazy. Chris Weidman, like Chris Weidman has no legs. He's Lieutenant Dan. And why would you bet him at plus 210? He's a legend, but he's not the same guy. Like former middleweight champion, you want to send your former champion off on a high note, but he should not be fighting. And we all know that. Guys, I'm not going to get into the weeds. I'm not going to go into the film. I'm not going to do any of that. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to say this. Um, I think Chris Weidman wins this fight. 
don't bet on it though. But I do think Chris Wyman wins the fight. Think about the whole context of what I just said. And I wanted to prove a point. I wanted to look at one thing. If you're Chris Wyman, what's the one thing that you're most terrified of? Say it with me. Three, two, one, getting leg kicked. Bruno Silva, look at the stats, and you'll see that that's not a big part of his game plan. Now, it's not to say that he's not going to try to spam leg kicks based off of you know Chris Weidman not having legs. He, If he's smart, that's going to be part of his plan because we saw Chris Weidman's complete inability to check one freaking kick against Brad Tavares. Like you thought Anthony Smith couldn't check a kick. Holy shit. Watch that fight against Brad Tavares. Brad Tavares hits him like 40 some odd times with leg kicks. It was terrible. And um, he ends up breaking his uh, lead leg. So Chris Weidman's a southpaw and his right leg was broken um, in that fight, the lead leg. So his left leg is in the back and that's the one that turned into a uh, windsock. And when I look at this, I think I, I can't help but think like the UFC knows that they're like, okay, well, like this Silva guy is not that great. Lost four out of his last five, and leg kicks aren't a big part of his game plan. So, that's guys. That's the best I have. This is not. This is not a uh, fight breakdown that's going to give me an Oscar. I know that, but don't bet on this fight. Don't bet on this fight. Prediction purposes, I'm saying Chris Weidman because that's the plan. That's what they want. It's in Atlantic City. Um, if Chris Weidman could get this fight down to the ground and choke out Bruno Silva, that's his best pathway to victory. Um, so sure, I will go with Chris Weidman by submission. I say he chokes out Silva in the second round. All right, guys, we are moving on to the co-main event where Vicente Luque will be going up against Joaquin Buckley. Now, I have to imagine at Killcliffe FC, there is a wanted poster of Joaquin Buckley in that gym at somewhere. Because Joaquin Buckley has had a lot of success against Killcliffe guys as of late. He has wins over Andre Filio, and he has a win over Impa Kasanganai. And uh, neither of these guys are with the promotion anymore. Killcliffe does not like that. Now, they do have one win over buckley but it happened way back in 2018 when logan storley fought him in bellator so they have an opportunity to finally get a win over a guy that they have not been able to beat for a number of years so you have to imagine that the team at Killcliffe, the coaches vicente luque everybody like they have the game plan they know what they want to do they know who joaquin buckley is they've seen this guy on three different occasions now so We'll see how this one ends up playing out. But um, let's talk about some recent fights. Um, for Joaquin Buckley, he fought Alex Morono. He was a minus 170 betting favorite in this fight, and this was a one-sided beatdown that uh, Buckley cruised to. I was very impressed with him. I actually bet on Alex Morono for this fight, and uh, yeah, I couldn't have been way. I couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, this was a complete masterclass performance by Joaquin Buckley, a job well done for him. He just absolutely beat the hell out of Alex Morono in this fight. Andre Filio. Um, Filio had some moments in this fight, particularly in the early parts of the second round, but then um, he ends up getting, he ends up getting head kicked and uh, taken out. You kind of feel for Andre Filio a little bit because he, he, he didn't, um, he saw the kick coming and he tried to catch it, but, um, Nonetheless, the, the kick connected and he is sprawled out like a big X on the canvas and he's completely out and you cannot fault uh, the referee for stepping in and um, and stopping that fight. So as of late, uh, we have seen a resurgence from Joaquin Buckley loses to Nazardini Mamov. You lose to Chris Curtis, but uh, you're able to uh, kind of make up for that by virtue of the two most recent fights. Vicente Luque. He was a plus 105 betting underdog against Rafael Dos Anjos. Now, this is a closer fight from what I remembered. I actually had to go back. I had to rewatch this one. And um, across all five rounds, I had this one scored 48-47 for Luque on the second watch because my memory was like, oh, yeah, uh, Luque dominated that fight. But actually, he didn't. It was actually quite close. 
I thought 40, 48, 47 was the right call. Um, you had Ron McCarthy turn in a bizarre 49, 46 for Luke. A. Uh, that was certainly suspect, but you know, that is Ron McCarthy. He is suspect. So like I said, anytime, uh, that guy scores a fight, expect the unexpected. Uh, but in any event, Luke a gets that one done. And then prior to that, he gets knocked out against Jeff Neal, and then he drops a decision against Bilal Muhammad. So an opportunity for Luke to start 2024 off on a good note. We saw um, bouts against Ian Gary fall off, a bout against uh, Sean Brady fall off. So it, it, it has been a bit since we've seen Vicente Luque in action. Um, again, this is one that I'm not going to think too much on. Uh, Vicente Luque minus 150 and then Joaquin Buckley plus 125. I think Buckley is way too low. Uh, I think if you like Joaquin Buckley, he should be in the plus 200 range at a bare minimum. I think there's a ton of value on Vicente Luque for this one. Minus 150, uh, I am all over that. I like Vicente Luque in this fight. I don't know if he's going to be able to put away Joaquin Buckley. And that's kind of where I've been thinking most of like, okay, do I like Vicente Luque by finish or do I like this one to go the distance? And I'm going to go the latter guys. I do think this one is going to uh, go to decision. I know Vicente Luque doesn't typically go to decision. I know we think of him, we think of finishes, but um, it's been a little bit of time since he's been in the, um, been in the cage. So I'm just going to say this one goes the full 15 minutes. All right, guys, we are on the main event where Aaron Blanchfield will be going up against Manon Firo in the main event. Um, now I just read on junkie that, uh, thug Rose is picking Aaron Blanchfield to win this fight. I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, despite her, uh, dropping her last fight against Fiero. I kind of expected Thug Rose to say like, yeah, Fiero is definitely going to win. But no, she didn't. She actually uh, was very complimentary of Aaron Blanchfield. Uh, so I thought that was kind of like an interesting tidbit there. Uh, Aaron Blanchfield, a young hotshot prospect, and she goes up against the relative newcomer to the UFC, which is Manon Fiero. Fiero has only been in the UFC since 2021. There's a 10 age, there's a 10 year age difference between Blanchfield and and Fiero, despite the age difference, Aaron Blanchfield has more MMA experience uh, than Fiero, which is kind of a fun fact. I wanted to um, look at that Talia Santos fight briefly, and Blanchfield was the minus 150 betting favorite in that fight, and it was a very rough start to the first round for her. She definitely took some damage. She got a little busted up. She got an abrasion on her nose in the uh, second round. We saw a turning point. Talia ends up making a mistake in the clinch. It ends up costing her position. We saw Aaron Blanchfield get a takedown and uh, get control over Santos in the second. And uh, going into the third, I had a 1-1 fight, but um, we saw Blanchfield end up turning it on. And uh, we saw Santos starting to fatigue as that fight ended up going down. And guys, uh, I thought it was a pretty clear 29-28 for Aaron Blanchfield against Talia Santos. This was a fight that a lot of people thought she was going to get exposed or fraud checked. That's a word that is uh, taken out of context in the MMA community. We um, use that word uh, somewhat recklessly, but uh, that didn't end up happening, and she ended up pulling through. Prior to that, she fought Jessica Andrade. She was a plus-115 betting underdog in that fight. And this was one where I was like, well, we're about to find out if this Aaron Blanchfield chick is the real deal or not. I remember thinking that, and I remember betting on Jessica Andrade in this fight. Because I had concerns. I had definite concerns about her ability to get this fight down to the ground. And there was a part of me that I was like, man, Jessica Andrade is just going to freaking uncork on Aaron Blanchfield. And guess what? I couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, in fact, we saw... Um, Blanchfield striking, she kept it basic. Basic. It wasn't flashy, but it was effective. Um, we saw her footwork on display. We saw her ability to dart in and out of the pocket. Um, we saw her apply pressure and then uh, know when to back out. And you saw Jessica Andrade start to get frustrated over the course of that fight. And you saw her charge at Aaron Blanchfield and just like windmill attack her. And she looked like a complete spaz. And 
you saw Aaron Blanchfield take advantage of those miscues. And we saw her get a body lock takedown over the course of that fight. And her grappling, um, her grappling prowess was on display. Jessica uh, gets herself on the ground. She panics, gives Aaron Blanchfield her back, and Aaron Blanchfield ends up choking her out. Man on Fierro has been going up against strikers lately. Very different, uh, very different opponents as of late. Um, obviously, Thug Rose, we think of somebody with karate, taekwondo, somebody with the striking, and then uh, Caitlin Chukagian, kind of the same deal there. So she's been going up against strikers, and both of these fights have been going, uh, they've turned into uh, drawn out point fights. Now, Man on Fierro, a good fighter. She is very good. Um, I like her quite a bit. But in this fight, guys, uh, I don't actually. I am going with uh, Aaron Blanchfield. And I get a lot of crap for saying this. Like, I am the skeptic. Like, I am the guy that picks the veterans often, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm that guy that's like, man, I don't know if this person is uh, all that they're cracked up to be. I picked Jack Hermanson, right? And I got a lot of crap for that. I picked Dustin Poirier. I got even more crap for that. Um, so, like, I am the guy that oftentimes these young hot shots come through and I'm just like, eh, I don't know about that. We'll see. But guys, Aaron Blanchfield to me is a future champion. And, um, a lot of people don't see that. I get, uh, I get picked on for having that opinion, but I think she's the real deal. I think she's better than man on fear row. I do. I think her striking is a lot better than what people think it is. I think her footwork is great and she is an elite grappler. And if man on fear row, finds herself on the ground, she will lose. 100%. Aaron Blanchfield is very strong, very technical, and there is a huge difference in the grappling should the fight make it there, and you'll see that. Striking, I don't know how much better Man on Fierro is uh, than Aaron Blanchfield. I don't know how much better Man on Fierro is in the striking department. And guys, when I look at this one, I can't help but think, like, we've already seen this fight before. It was against Talia Santos, and we saw Aaron Blanchfield give up the first round, make the adjustments, and then start fighting the fight on her terms. Here's the thing about Aaron Blanchfield is she may not get the takedowns. In fact, she didn't take down uh, Talia Santos one time. She tried 13 takedowns over the course of that fight. She didn't hit on any of them, but she was able to uh, outclinch Talia Santos and control her there. And she's not going to give up on those takedowns. She's going to have like a fluffy Hernandez sort of game plan where if she, whether she gets it or not, the pressure will be there the entire time. The takedown attempts will be there the entire time. She's exhausting the fight against. I think the pressure and that grappling threat is going to severely limit man on Fierro in there. Man on Fierro is not going to be comfortable at all. I think she's going to have a hard time dealing with the pressure She's not going up against somebody like Rose. She's not going up against somebody like uh, Caitlin Chukagian. This is a very different stylistic matchup for her. And Aaron Blanchfield, I was able to get her at minus 140 earlier this week. The lines have grown. She's now minus 155. But guys, I think that is the right pick. That is who I'll be taking in the main event. All right, guys, that's going to go ahead. That'll do it for this episode. As always, if you disagree with me on any of these picks, please drop them in the comments below. Tell me who you have in the matchups. I all and we'll continue our conversation there. Thank you guys for tuning into this episode, and I'll catch you next week.